Hey, do you want to build a stronger family, create a better life? Well, that's what Divorce with Heart is all about. It's a show where I guide you along your divorce and co-parenting journey using the heart's wisdom, intuition, and legal expertise. So sit back, take a deep breath, relax. My name is Gina DiPrima. Let's get started. Hey, how's everybody doing today? It's um, a holiday here in the States and in Canada, so I hope some of you are off and maybe even able to call me live. It's a special show today. I don't even know what episode number we're on. I apologize. I'm thinking somewhere along the lines of maybe 24, 25, something like that. But uh, we're doing an answer show today. So if you are following me on Facebook or Instagram or part of the Divorce With Heart group, then you probably saw me asking for you to submit me your questions, your difficulties, any challenges you might be dealing with in the area of you know, custody, co-parenting, financial issues, and I got a lot of feedback. So that's what today's show is all about. It's an opportunity for you to call with your questions, which of course that is there for you every week without question, um, and an opportunity for me to really engage with you a little more fully and answer any questions that maybe you post to me through social media or by sending an email because you're you know, not able to join us here live. And if you wanted to call in, that number again is one seven six zero four five six seven two seven seven. And um, I'm also going to be joined today by, a, by another rock star of divorce. His name is Joe, and uh, he's recently divorced, so he's got a story to tell for sure. And he'll be on here in just a little bit. So let's dive right into your questions. Okay. And I'm not going to give names because it wasn't clear to me whether people wanted to submit these questions anonymously or not. So I'm just going to dive right in and read to you what I have. So here's from one listener. She writes, hello, and thank you for this group. I'm currently separated, but still living together for financial reason reasons and to both be as available as possible for our kids ages eight and six. It's been a hard road, but for the most part, we're managing to remain friendly and supportive under the difficult circumstances. My question is, how do you know when it's time to separate living arrangements? And is it possible to maintain a co-parenting house share situation without losing your sense of self? We both have mostly separate social lives and there are irreconcilable differences in values and emotional needs. Any advice appreciated. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I do have a lot to say about this, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> so the first question that she's asking here is, how do you know when it's time to separate your living arrangements? You know, on the one hand, I think you can look at it from kind of more of that obvious, rational perspective of, well, what's going on around you? What's happening in the house? I mean, you, you mentioned that you have two young children, ages eight and six. So I would say that the most obvious telltale signs that you need to separate your living arrangements is, um, you know, is there, what kind of, what's the, what's the atmosphere? You know, what's the level of tension? That's really what I'm getting at. What's the level of tension in the home? Are you and your partner or former partner, it says that you're separated, are you arguing, arguing regularly, bickering? Are you ignoring each other and giving each other the silent treatment? Because that can be just as damaging to kids. Um are you making snide comments about one another? Are you rolling your eyes when you see each other? So that, I think, is, you know, probably the more obvious answer and probably not what you're looking for because you probably could have guessed that already, I'm assuming. So, you know, basically, if there is drama in the house, if there is fighting and arguing in the house and a lot of bickering and tension is high, then 
Yes, in my opinion, it is absolutely 100% time to separate your living arrangement. Um, just because of, of what you're doing, not only to yourself, but to your children as well. Um, but d- dig a little deeper than that. Let's just assume for the sake of the question here that everybody is kind of doing okay, that there's not a lot of tension in the house, because that's kind of the sense that I'm getting when I'm reading the question, is that everyone's just kind of doing their own thing. You know, mom and dad have different social lives, probably different work schedules, and they're probably alternating in and out of the house and alternating responsibility for the kids while trying to stay save money and stay together. And this is not such an unusual situation, I will tell you. I've heard this several times, and in fact, Oftentimes when people are even just going through the divorce process, they are living together. Um, And a lot of the reason why is for financial purposes, to try and save money. So let's look at it from that perspective. From that perspective, I would say, you know, see if you can take more of a bird's eye view of the situation. See if you can examine your family, your home life, the energy of where you are every day, where you're laying your head every night, where your children are, see if you can almost step outside of yourself and look at it almost from like this bird's eye view, you know? So it's like, you're not even you, you're an observer of what's happening. And, you know, see if you can't try to gauge from that perspective, how are you really feeling in this mix. You know, what What are you really feeling? Feeling, not thinking, but what are you really feeling on a daily basis? Are you feeling like you're a little bit kind of hesitant, a little reserved, a little regarded, a, a little walking on eggshells? Or are you feeling more light and free and, you know, more expansive? Because I think if you're kind of constricted, then you know, you're holding back. There's something holding back. And there's some reason, and I'm going to just go out there and say it, it seems like it's money. It's money on the outside. But to dig a little deeper, it's something else. There's something else that's keeping you in that situation. So see if you can get more of that broad perspective. Um, and, And see if when you do that, if you can't maybe get some kind of feeling maybe or a sign or something like that to to kind of clue you in the direction of what else might be holding you back. Maybe you don't want to let go. Maybe you're really afraid to be alone. Um, Maybe you're really afraid to just fully 100% absorb the fact that the marriage is over. You know, maybe there's a part of you that's just holding on and just wanting it to be different. So that's not accepting what is. It's kind of resisting what is and holding on. And in the end, really delaying the inevitable. So see if maybe there isn't something else underlying that issue of we're staying together for the purpose of money and savings and, you know, financial reasons. What is, what are you afraid of? Right. And, um, If you had the money, right, let's just say, you know, just play a little mental game, imaginary game in your mind. If you had the money, somebody dropped it in your lap the next day, would that change it for you? And how soon would that change it for you? I think those are important questions of self-inquiry. Now, some people can stay together for a long time. I believe um, one of our co-hosts even commented in the Facebook group on this very question that at one time when she was going through a divorce, I believe she stayed married or stayed living with her ex for quite some time after the divorce. That would be Jeannie Lee Perrin, and she has a show on this station too. Super wonderful person. You'd want to listen to that as well. But And I believe that was the crux of her comment. So it is possible to do that, but I I'm going to say that I think you really need to have a strong sense of self to do that and to feel good about yourself and really know if it is financial, then so be it. It's financial. But you're going to really want to make sure that it isn't something else and that you're just using the finances kind of as an excuse, you know, because there's other things to be gained when you're living in that situation. Um, so... 
Second part of her question is, is it possible to maintain this co-parenting house share situation without losing your sense of self? And, you know, I think you've got to back up from that question and first know what is your sense of self? How, how deep, how deep is your knowledge and intuition of yourself? How well do you know yourself? Um, because a lot of times when we're in a relationship for a long period of time, and especially when we're going through the breakup, that is one of the underlying kind of reasons of a breakup is somewhere along the way, you may have stepped outside of yourself. You may have forgot yourself. You may have forgot who you truly really are at your core, and you may have molded yourself to somebody else. And the reason why I say that this is a reason that creeps up a lot is because I really believe that breakups in part, well, I think 100% they serve a purpose, but in part, that purpose is to really wake you up, to wake you up kind of like out of this slumber or this false belief of who you think you are, what you might think you need, what you might think you want, and to really bring you back to the awesomeness of who you truly are, right? To your true essence, to your true soul self, right? Um, And I just feel like that just gets lost. We lose that in life. And, And it starts from a very, very young age when we even just start to define ourselves based on the reactions we get from others. You know, we start to learn what do we like? What's good behavior? When am I a good girl? When am I a bad girl? We learn these things based on how others see us, our parents, most often, you know, teachers, siblings. And little by little, uh, it's almost like we step into this other uh, model of ourselves, we'll call it, right? Like a clay model of yourself instead of who you truly really are in the deepest sense at your core. So is it possible to maintain it without losing your sense of self? I think yes. Absolutely it is, but you need to have that strong sense of self first and, you know, to realize whether that's where you're at and is this just a boundary issue, I think it's going to require quite a bit of self-inquiry um, and healing because you wouldn't be in the spot um, had there, if there isn't a need for either of those things, right? So... Overall, really get into the depth of this question and and step outside of yourself to see how you might be benefiting, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, you know, how how are you benefiting at the end of the day and staying in the situation? What are you gaining by it and what are you losing? And it's very possible that you're losing an opportunity, you know, because the more you are in a situation living with somebody and they're your children, you're also sending that message out to the universe, right? That this is your family, this is your lifestyle, everything is the way that it is. You're not sending a message out um, that would be serving anything greater than what you have. Uh, so think about it like that too. If you're if you're just staying together for financial reasons, are you not saying also that I'm not strong enough to stand on my own, that I can't financially support myself on my own, that I can't be resourceful enough to figure out how to do this. Um, And those are tough questions and tough things to realize and to really observe within ourselves. So, but, but very important if you want to use this part of your life as an opportunity to really just move forward and grow as a result of it and hopefully develop even a deeper sense of yourself and who you are. Okay, next question. Um, okay, I, and again, I'm not going to name a name, but this came through also, I believe, in the Facebook group. I loved the podcast Co-Parenting with a Narcissist. I've listened to it twice in one week to help remind me. What I need to know and figure out how to handle is the immediate attack on my person, on my character, on my parenting, and on my values. How to process that quickly and let it go. It takes me down like I'm punched in the gut. I have the urge to respond, but I don't. I can be a gray rock, but I can't help but question some of his twisted half-truths. 
It makes me question things. It makes me question my parenting and my judgment. As parents, we already question if we are doing things right. Then to have someone whisper in your ear constantly that you're not. Sometimes it occurs at just the right, uh, I think it means time, that it takes me out and it leaves me in a heap of tears and it leaves me wounded. Oh, well, I can certainly sympathize 100% with what you're saying. And I'm sure that even just in me reading your words, that there's many out there who are wondering the same thing, which is why I just love this um, part of the show to be able to do this. The first thing that I want to say in answer to the question of how do you process that quickly and let it go? Um, it's a bit of a mindset shift. What I'm going to suggest first and foremost is forget about the processing and the speed of the processing and processing it quickly and letting it go. What if you didn't need to process it? What if you were able to really see it for what it is? Something different. He's different. He's emitting this different energy, this different frequency. He's kind of dark. He's bad. He's trying to take you down. I mean, and however you want to see it in your mind, you know, but if you just saw it as something that doesn't resonate with you, that's on a different level from you, you know, like you're just two ships passing in the night or two trains going past each other that never merge, never, never mind. Well, obviously that would be a crash, but (laughs) if you can see what I'm saying here, you know, In other words, in order to process something, if you think about it like that, it immediately makes me think that you're engaging, that there's a giving and a receiving that goes into processing, that there's two parts to the puzzle, right? But I'm saying, what if we don't even think about it like that? And you think about it like you're just on two completely different levels and his level is not meeting your level because you are vibrating and you are on such a different level that like whatever he is going to then do, however he is going to act, whatever he's going to throw at your way, it just pops right off you or slides right off you like Teflon, right? It doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect you. And it doesn't affect you because again, going back to that sense of self, knowing deeply 100% who you truly are. And I know that that's hard. That's really hard, especially when you're in the the throes of a breakup. And again, I believe that's one of the reasons why, you know, these things happen in our lives. It's like the universe is nudging us back on track, right? So instead of thinking about how do you process it, focus on yourself. Focus on yourself and how you are feeling Every day, every moment of your life, as often as you can. And when you feel yourself a little off balance, a little sad in the car, a little stressed out, having a little too much tension, take yourself back and remind yourself of who you really are. You know, do some deep breathing. Feel yourself in your body. If you do yoga, it's great practice. Do some yoga and really go inside of yourself. When I work with people in divorce intelligence, these are some of the top things that we work on because rediscovering and reclaiming your life and your sense of self is so, so important. And in divorce intelligence, we work on different um, practice things that you can do, different breathing exercises, different things um, really that you can do to just really help build yourself up so you can be Teflon. And not only that, We also work on things to just sort of set the tone and make it so when you are going to have an encounter, um, we're really boosting you up. So you're definitely not going to be on that same level and not quite as susceptible to, to what's going on. So in the process of that, other things that you can do is, um, mantras, But again, it's got to be something that is really important to you, that fits with you on every level. And the point being that when you find yourself getting triggered, it's something you can go back to quickly and anchor yourself into. So then it's like, okay, even though he's shooting this tarpoon at you and it might get you a little, it's stuck a little, you know what? You can rip it right out. It doesn't have to take you down. You know, it could feel a little bit like a punch in the gut. 
because we're all human, of course, and we all have feelings and it hurts to hear things that are nasty and criticizing and insulting. That's part of your human nature. Be grateful for it, but don't let it resonate in you. Pluck it back out like you're plucking out that tarpoon, right? Because you don't want to let it fester. And the only way you don't let it fester and get the best of you is by just really working on getting to know you because then you know the truth. And when you know the truth of who you are, then nothing anybody says, nothing anybody does, nothing can affect you. So that's really the key right there is getting super honest, super honest with yourself and knowing you know, the value of your parenting and the value of your judgment and recognizing also that what he may be saying to you and how he may be acting at the end of the day, it isn't about you. Okay. It's not about you. It's more about him than it could ever, ever be about you. So don't take it in again and make it about you. Instead, remind yourself of that fact. It's just a fact. Whatever he's saying, whatever he's seeing in you, it's something about him that he doesn't like and can't come to terms with. So again, you're pushing it away. And there's a lot of energetic things you can do too. Um, you know, briefly when I, when I work with people in divorce intelligence, we do different energetic techniques. Like, uh, we work with the idea of putting mirrors around your field and your aura and protecting yourself before you even go out into these kinds of situations. So again, it's kind of reflecting off of you back onto the person. We do other things to just kind of like seal up your your energy line and your meridians so that you're not even letting these things break in. So, so that's what you want to do. The long and short of it again is to just focus on yourself your vibration, how you're feeling, and getting really, really deep into knowing who you are. So at the root of that, if you're struggling, it's an opportunity. It's a, it's a, it's the universe calling you and saying, look, let's wake up. Let's stop this from happening because you're going to get over him. There's no question you will. Um, but you want to come out of it a stronger, um, a stronger version of yourself. You, but better, right? Okay, one more question, and then we're going to take a quick break because I've got my wonderful, awesome rock star of divorce with us online waiting. So one more question, and then we'll take a break, and we'll bring Joseph on. Okay, so last question. Uh, how to cope with being the, with, excuse me, how to cope with being the codependent with an ex who is a narcissist. I know you've covered this before, but I really think you can expand on how to deal with feelings of codependency and self-doubt. And I'm really struggling with this right now. So, so there again, you know, so much of this, really all three of these questions are in some way uh, dressed in this energy of of codependency, right? Codependency is a theme that is running through all three of these questions because when you're codependent, codependent, and you're doubting yourself, you're there's this lack of knowing, there's this lack of self trust, this lack of self love, the lack of self awareness. It's like everything is outside of you, and you're not sourcing your own happiness and freedom, right? So how do you break or how do you cope with being codependent with an ex who's a narcissist? Well, again, you don't lose this opportunity and you take it as an opportunity and an opportunity to heal this um, because, because that's it. The best antidote to codependency is meeting yourself, reclaiming yourself, you know, renewing yourself. And just, it's, it's all about self-discovery because when you can do that and you can see yourself the way you are meant to be seen, not the way that you've been told, you know, not who you've been told you are and that kind of a thing. You don't have codependency anymore. I mean, so that's really what it is. It's all about healing and taking this as an opportunity to get to know yourself and working with it every day. There's no quick fixes, right? This isn't an overnight thing. And, you know, some people think, oh, you know, I don't need to take the time to heal or healing's too expensive. I don't need anybody to help me and I'll be better in time. I've always been better in time. Sure, because no doubt it's probably not your first breakup. The reality is, is even though the pain wears off, right? The pain wears off, you move on because you're distracted by life and work and kids and other things. 
If you don't get in there and you heal it, it will resurface again. And that is really the point of all of this, isn't it? Isn't the point of all this so that you can learn and grow and find out something about yourself and 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 serve yourself in a way so you're never going to be in that same situation again? I think so. So, okay. Um, oh, one quick tip. I almost forgot. This was in my notes in going through all this. Something that you might want to consider. Make a list. Make a list of all of the things that you value about yourself and add to that list every day. And I mean, it could be from something simple to, you know, I have five fingers and or 10 fingers. <laughs> Maybe I just have five. <laughs> 10 fingers, 10 toes. And that's a, that's a good thing because I could function, you know, whatever it is from the simplest to the complex. Make a list of things that you can really value and appreciate about yourself. Remind yourself of those things add to it daily, and then look yourself in the mirror and, you know, thank yourself once in a while. Thank yourself for being here. Thank yourself for waking up. Thank yourself for going to work, you know, for trying to put food on the table for your kids, for loving your kids, for being patient when it's not always easy to be patient, right? That's going to really help you, I think. It's going to help you to start to see the light of who you really are. Okay? So, all right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Joe. Thanks. Hi, it's Gina here. Did you know that every week I meet with a group of people just like you who are struggling with the pain of divorce? I help them to feel good about themselves again, make better choices, overcome their fears. I call it divorce intelligence. And you know what? It doesn't matter where you are or what stage of the process you're in. It could be before, during, or even after because we meet online. It's super simple. All that fighting, the crazy legal fees, the constant anger, the frustration, it's not mandatory. You don't have to struggle through this alone, and you don't have to question if you're doing the right thing. There's a better way, and I know it works. Every week in my group, I draw on my legal experience and conscious uncoupling processes to help guide you through the process. And you know what else? I tap into the spiritual realm. I bring ancient healing techniques and soul-level guidance to you so you can experience deep, everlasting change. So if you're ready to heal and save yourself some time, money, and years of frustration, not just for you, but for your kids too, then give me a call and join Divorce Intelligence. It's a totally free call. All you have to do is go to doorwaytoheal.com. That's doorwaytoheal.com. Dot com. I know you deserve a life of peace and happiness. So if you're ready to really divorce with heart, give me a call. Let's work together. Some of you have questions about your partnership, marriage, or co-parenting situation. I'm here for you. Give me a call in today's live episode by dialing the U.S. number 1-760-456-7277. That's 1-760-456-7277. Talk to you soon. Hey, Joe, are you there? Hello. Joe, are you there? Hi. (laughs) Wonderful. How How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being here. You are our rock star of divorce. (laughs) How do you like that? (laughs) Uh, Has a nice ring to it. Yeah, right. Well, you are. You are. So, so why don't we start by just giving everybody listening a little bit of background? You know, if you want, you can tell them how you and I know each other. I'll leave that to you. Uh, and just, you know, how long have you been married? Just a little bit of the background. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so, I think my divorce just uh, was finalized in the end of June, um, and you were my uh, attorney throughout. Um, so I was with my ex 
for seven years. Um, we were married for three. Uh, we have two children together, one who's turning four at the end of this month and one who just turned two, uh, both, uh, both girls. Yeah. <laughs> so, and tell people, you know, because right away I'm sure they're thinking, great, you know, here's a dad, two little girls, and although the system has changed over the years, I hear it a lot. Maybe you even said it or asked about it when you first came in to see me, but like, what are my odds of getting custody? Is this really just a woman's system? Am I, you know, SOL? What are your thoughts there? What'd you learn about that? Um, well, you know, I was very, uh, I would say either fearful or skeptical that, you know, I've heard so many things from uh, my other friends who have been divorced or just, I think it's more so just like the um, societal construct that we are, that as men, like that's just kind of our mindset. Like we think like, oh, like if there's a woman mediator or if there's a woman judge, like I'm, I'm basically like I'm screwed, like I have no chance of winning. Um, I think really what it comes down to is that like if you're a good dad and I think if you hire the right attorney um, who um, has experience and the knowledge to, you know, walk you through the process and let you know, you know, what what you're legally entitled to and and that like it, they're really – I was put at, at ease just um, through our, our various talks. Um, and also, you know, once I actually got into the process and, um, you know, the kind of the back and forth between attorneys and the back and forth between my ex and I, um, that really the, the ball is in your court. And it just depends on, like, where on the court you want to go with it. Um, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that because it's so true. And sometimes I just talk with men that are just right away discouraged, thinking like there's no point in this, you know, and they don't even want to try. But you're right. The ball is in your court. It just depends on where you want to go with it. I also think, though, that it is very quickly apparent while you're going through the process on what your intentions are. And, you know, I know, Joe, in talking with you, your intentions were always your girls and always you know, doing what is best for them and wanting to be 100% fully involved and committed in their lives. And I think that that's just an important thing to say because, you know, some people's, their intention may be, well, I want to have my kids half of the time, but it's not really about the kids, right? Do you know what I mean? Have you ever <laughs> talked to anybody or had any experience with that? Um, yeah, I mean, it... <laughs> So, I mean, with, with my story, I mean, obviously you're very familiar with it, but um, my ex was um, very reluctant to give me what I wanted, which was as close to 50-50 as possible. And, um, you know, initially, what, and when I've had this conversation with, like, many people, whether it be, you know, peers in school or professionally or just friends, like, um, they automatically think or slash know that it has to do with money. Um, so... They, they think that just because you have 50 50 custody that you know you're not going to have to pay your your ex-spouse child support um which is n not true at all um right at definitely not true in I, new york <laughs> right right mm -hmm. so and that was and that was my ex's um biggest um hesitation because she thought that if i did have 50 50 custody that i would no longer be required to pay her child support so um basically where we were was we were in a place where I wanted two days more in a two-week period because that's the rotation that we're on with custody. And she just kept fighting me and fighting me and fighting me. And it finally took us to go to mediation for the the, the female medi mediator, which also that, that kind of struck some fear into me too because I was thinking like, oh, please let it be a guy because I feel like if it's, if it's a woman that, um, you know, there'll be more on her side. But the mediator made, made it very clear that, you know, the girls are no – no more hers than they are mine. Like I'm their dad and she's their mom. And there's no, you know, there's no one person doesn't have any more say or power, or whatever you want to call it over the other parent. Like they're equally ours. And we needed to work together as a team to try to figure out, and like you said, what is best for the girls, which has always been what my goal is, is what, what is the best thing for them? Um, mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about that. 
Right. Yes, you're right. And I'm glad that you addressed it like that, because there is the the converse relationship there, which you just said, where there's just some moms who just don't want to give up, again, thinking that it's going to affect them financially. And it doesn't have to. And quite honestly, as an attorney, it's one of my greatest pet peeves. I can't stand it when people are, you know, trading kids for cash. (laughs) I mean, it's a reality. It's a reality of the system. Um, But there's certainly ways around it. And or lately I, I had I had kids trading kids a day for the kids in exchange for like a lawnmower or something. (laughs) So, wow. uh, Anyhow. Yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) having gone through it in all aspects, what would you say now looking back was the most difficult part for you? Um, I think it's actually kind of, it's twofold. So it's, it's Mm -hmm. the process to the divorce, but then, the after, like part of part of it afterwards. So, the the first part I'll talk about is the process. So it's more so the like the uncertainty of what was going to happen with custody, because I had this this predisposition in my head that you know it's basically it's um, like she's going to get whatever she wants. Like I'm not going to get anything. Like I'm going to get screwed and blah 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 blah. And I think that that was the toughest part for me because my girls are so important to me that. I was afraid that, you know, she would, you know, start making up lies or or painting me and or putting me in a bad light, which she kind of sort of tried to do during mediation by telling the mediator that I was a bad dad. And then we kind of really got to the, the core of why she was saying that is because she was afraid that she would lose um, child support. Um, so that that was probably the, the uncertainty of not knowing how much I would get to see my kids. Um that was probably the toughest thing for me, um, especially because I, I was going from a place to seeing them, you know, from the second that they woke up until the second I put them down for bed at night. So, you know, that that was the toughest part for me. The, the second part is is was post post divorce, which was kind of um, like the dating aspect because, you know, dating prior to seven like seven years ago, it, it the game's completely changed. It's, it's so different now <laughs> that. Uh, that I was just kind of like, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. Um, and then on top of that, finding somebody, um, that understands what it's like to have kids and, um, as opposed to who don't have kids, it was, it was really tough. That was really tough too. Um, so yeah, the dating, the dating post, post, uh, post-divorce dating is not as fun as I thought maybe it would be, um, because it's changed so much, (laughs) but those two things definitely were tough. So how did you deal with that uncertainty and, you know, just this whole idea that she she was trying to say things about you and paint you in this negative light? Because that did happen, not just in the mediation. But what are some things that you did to kind of deal with that that maybe somebody else might be able to do? Right. I mean, so I surrounded myself with a lot of positive people. Um, so I had a lot of friends. I had family that were very supportive. Uh, I belong to a church. I'm very involved with my church. Um, I received a ton of support directly from pastors, you know, checking in on me every day and making sure that I was okay. And, um, just reminding me that, you know, I am a good dad and, um, and that no matter, you know, what she's saying on Facebook, um, insinuating things about me on Facebook to people that don't really know the full, the full situation, everything that happened surrounding the divorce and the reason for the divorce, it was just, you know, constantly being in contact with those people, um, just like I said, surrounding myself with positive people and, and having the right support, um, mm-hmm. and and also through our conversations, um, just you know, just reminding me of what like the what the finish line looks like and how to get there, and just you know that it's not always going to be like this. Um, so all those things combined, I think, really helped me um, get through it. Hmm. And did you respond when you saw these kinds of things on Facebook or were you taking the approach more like, you know, you're Teflon and it's just going to bounce off of you? What did you do? Um, I, well, there were, you know, there were various Facebook posts that were posted about me. Uh, like I said, in, insinuating that, you know, I, I was doing X, Y, Z. Um, mm-hmm. A couple of times I did address it with her. You know, I would screenshot it to her and basically say, like, like, why are you doing this? Like, what it what is the point behind this? Because all you're doing is just painting me out to be a bad person. When in reality, like you and I both know the truth 
And she was just like, you don't know how much you hurt me, and this is why I'm doing this. I'm like, well, it's it's not really doing anything for either one of us. Like, it just basically is making it seem like you're attention-seeking and I'm a jerk. So, like, it's really not doing anything positive for either one of us. So I would address it, but there were some times, too, where, like, if, if it was just so outlandish and, and just just out of the out of the blue, like, I, I wouldn't even bother saying anything. Like, she eventually would ask me, like, if I did, if, I, if people were sending them to me. And I would say yes, but for the most part, I, I really wouldn't. Um, unless it was really, like, attacking my character, like, I, I really wouldn't address it. Um, I would just kind of let it just lay right. there. And and, it, and I think, to be fair, even though you responded at times, uh, you always did it in more of a private way. And your response was always one that was still... Um, well, respectful for what it for what it's worth, you know. You didn't continue to try and reengage, from what I remember, and I think that that's important. And part of that has to be attributed to the fact that you do have a pretty strong sense of self, and you had people around you supporting you. So no matter what she said, right, you knew deep inside what the truth is, which is everything that I was just kind of saying before I brought you on here today in answer to people. Right. I don't know if you heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, no, I, yeah, I heard most of it. Um, I think, you know, the, just the biggest thing too, would just, I mean, whether you're male or female is to just not use social media as an outlet to air your dirty laundry and with regards to anything, but more specifically about your divorce, just because Amen. It's, just not for, <laughs> yeah, it's not a good look for anybody involved. I posted one thing on my Facebook about my divorce and it was after she discovered people posting stuff. And like you said, I, I was very respectful. And I still do love my ex, you know, even though I chose to divorce her and um, I started the process, like I, I still love her. She's still the mother of my children. I still try to have a good relationship with her regardless of, you know, how she feels about me. Like it, it isn't, it isn't just about the kids, like you said, but it is like, I, I try to keep um, a good relationship with her because I want the kids to know, like they're going to, especially because they're both girls, like they're going to see they're going to look to me first to see how I treat women. And that's going to dictate how their expectations for what they, how they should be treated for the rest of their life. So it's kind of a little bit of pressure on me, but that's also part of the reason why, you know, I want to maintain a good relationship with her so that they could see like how, how they should be spoken to and how they should be treated and how they should be respected. Because you can, even if, even if people are trying to put you down, you can still go about it in a, in a, in a respectful way um, without putting the other person down. Um, because it's really all it's going to do is just turning in. It's just going to turn into just a, a venom versus venom type thing, and that's just not like you'd rather. I'd rather just kill people with kindness than than just spew hate. It, it just does nothing. I just love what you just said, and that's why you're a rock star. <laughs> I just love, love, love what you just said because it's so true. You know, I mean, and this is what I'm harping on all the time. You are modeling. You are modeling for your girls at every moment. So, and, and kids are smart, right? I mean, even at their young ages, they are smart and they pick up on on the disconnect between like words and energy. You know what I mean? So you yeah. just bring it all together at once. It's not like you're just saying one thing and then you're kind of feeling and acting different. You know, you've, you've kind of aligned both of those together and, and that, for the sake of your kids, right? And so much so, too. I think people should know this, that even though you're in the middle of the divorce, because you were able to do this and remember that she was fighting him every step of the way and did not want to share custody. So this was not easy. And she was talking pretty badly about you. But when push came to shove and she even found herself in trouble and needing some support and assistance, she called you. <laughs> notwithstanding all the okay. risks, right? And I think yeah, absolutely. ultimately that's what you want in the long run because sure, your kids right now, right? They're two and four. They're going to be teenagers one day and even older than that one day. And it's like you need to be able to still have that bridge, I think, between the two of you, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, like I said uh, before, like it's not, it's, it's not just about the girls, but it, it also is at the same time. And um, I think you said it perfectly. Like it's, I think, you know, more so than anything, like if anyone, for those of you that are listening, that it's, it's more of a mindset than it is anything. Um, almost even may, maybe like a culture, if you, if you may, like, if you are saying like, I want a really good relationship with my ex-wife, or I really, I want a really good relationship with my ex-husband, but your actions aren't, aren't saying that, 
like they, they really do need to align with the mindset that, you know, like you want to maintain a good relationship with them for the sake of the kids and for the sake of just being a good human being. Um, I think it's important right. to remember that especially when things get nasty, whether it be custody or over property or over money, um, it's just important to re- remember to just maintain your integrity and even encourage the other person to do the same because I did that throughout too. Like I kept telling her like, you're better than this. Like, I know that you're better than this and you're just, you're just hurt because I wanted a divorce from you. And I mean, it's, it's totally normal to have, you know, those, those human emotions where, you know, there's, there's pain and anger and sadness. And it's like, I totally got it. Um, especially with the field that I'm going into. So, um, Mm -hmm. like we are human, but at the same time, you got to just remember to just rein it in. And it's not all just about you. Like there's other mitigating factors that, that come into place. Yeah. And, and you did see her differently. Like you didn't see just her on the surface and the way that she was acting and her behavior and her words and the things that she did. It's like you almost, uh, forced yourself, I guess, in a way, I I can't think of a better word to describe it, but it's like you almost forced yourself to see her soul, right? To see the goodness in her. And I think that that's so important and without it, you know, that's, it just makes it too much easier to get hung up and in, into these like never ending arguments and fights. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. It's, it's almost like it's definitely seeing past the surface and just, you know, being with somebody for seven years, you basically learn, you, you almost know them as, as much as they know themselves. So it was important to remember those, those good things about her. Like, you know, even, even as far as it goes to say, it's like why I fell in love with her, you know, because it didn't just, you know, I didn't just say like, "Hey, I think I'm going to marry this person for no reason." Like, there are good parts about my act, um, even still to this day that I can mention. So, yeah, it was just seeing past just you know the emotions and just you know sometimes the straight up hatred that some of the stuff that she was saying, and looking past it and um, looking at the bigger picture. Yes, and knowing it's just coming from a place of hurt and pain and and even though yeah like you said you were the one that wanted the divorce it's still painful right and it still hurts you i don't think it makes a difference that much in who actually asks for it i mean there's a small difference because if you're on the receiving end you quite have as much time to prepare yourself mentally but it's a painful process either way yeah right yeah definitely yeah I, i definitely agree um it's you know it's you kind of at least for me like i i felt like like a failure I don't know if I want to say like as a, as a, I would say more as like as a father, as a husband, and as a person because you know I invested so much time in this relationship, and you know seven years is a long time; it's almost a decade, and it it kind of hurt my my ego a little bit that I I I put a lot of the blame on myself like I could have done this differently or I could have done that differently, um, but you know through the process I realized you know that that's not true that it's 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 always a two way street regardless if it's a platonic relationship or or an intimate relationship that um, it's, it was really just both like, we just weren't a good match for each other. That's really what it came down to. But um, yeah, that was, it was definitely tough for me to, cause I felt like I was giving up and um, you know, and she, and she repeatedly said that like you made vows and you made you promised God and um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that was kind of playing into, into, into my soul too, at the same time. So all that stuff put together Definitely. Um, it's not just if you're on the receiving end, but also if you're initiating it too. It definitely was not easy. Mm-hmm. Are you at a place now, though, where you can look back on it and you see it differently? Like, no, it's not that I gave up or she gave up. It's just the relationship was moving us in a different direction. You know, like there was a purpose in it that needed to happen. Do you see it like that now in any way? Yeah, definitely. There's, yeah, there's definitely things that I'm like, I'm definitely grateful for the time that I had with my ex because I learned a lot about myself in the process. Um, so yeah, def- I definitely look at it a lot differently. Like in the moment, you know, in the process of divorce, um, there was just so many, you know, so many different opinions getting thrown at me from like family, friends, church, uh, from you. Um, <laughs> so it, and what's the one I, opinion you it, should listen to? <laughs> just kidding. True. No, okay. um, mm-hmm. so many things are going on at that time that like, you know, once you're out of it and you're able to take, take a step back and look at it. Um, it, it definitely, I'm in a much better place now, um, than I was then. So I'm, I'm grateful for the experience. Um, and if I had to do it the same way, uh, if I had to do it again, I would do it the same exact way. I wouldn't change anything about it. Um, just because of the, the, the good things that came out of it. Um, it, it mm-hmm. was all good things to be honest. I mean, um, you know, as much as I say that I, I still love my wife, I, my ex-wife, I got, 
out of a toxic relationship and I'm, you know, I'm with someone now who is incredible and, um, loves my kids and I, I love her, I love her daughter and it, it just ended up working out. So it looks like you figured out, uh, the dating world after all, <laughs> what tips do you have there? Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I'm glad that you brought that up because I was thinking about that before I got on that. I think if I could do one thing over actually, so I take back what I said about doing things the same way. I think that I would have taken a little bit more time to focus on rediscovering myself because I did, I kind of did it like at the same time, um, like rediscovering myself and then jumping back into the dating world. And I don't think looking back now that I was ready to get back into dating. Um, number one, because I just wasn't ready for how much the game had changed. And then number two, I just wasn't really ready to put myself out there. Like there was still a lot of stuff that I had to get back to um i had to get back to me like the original me before pre my you know pre my relationship with my ex um so yeah that's that's definitely something that i that i would change just taking some more time for myself because it, it is hard like you're with somebody every day for seven years and then suddenly you're not like you come home to an empty house um you know you're not getting a text from them you know um daily saying like hey i hope your day was good i love you um et cetera, et cetera. So. That was uh that's definitely something I think that I that I would change. I would I would just hold off and rediscover myself um, before, you know, getting back into even just casually dating. Like because that's ultimately what I was doing. I was just casually dating, um, and then you know a couple of them turned into relationships, and I just I just wasn't. I had to get back to me. Mm hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, well, that's what I'm preaching about all the time, right? <laughs> because that's how I see the whole process as. It's it's really something that's happening, not just to take you down, but to really really catapult you into a future and hopefully put you back into this place of knowing who you really are. You know, and that's that's what I try to bring through in my practice and representing people, and then through the coaching that I have on the side. So um, I am so thankful that you came on today. Any other last words of wisdom? We're just about done. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, yeah. I mean. Like I said, I mean, just to kind of summarize, um, I think it's just it's just to, to it's important to remember to just maintain that mindset. You know, even if you even if you don't have children, because I know there's probably some people listening that don't have kids. That that entire part just completely went out the window. But um, I think it's just important to just remember that mindset. And even if you have to think of it like yep. that when you're communicating with your ex, that, that's it. You know. <laughs> There are, Thank yeah, there so are things that you once loved about them that it, even if you just have to remember those things while you're communicating with them, just be respectful um, and just let them know that, you know, even though it may not have worked out, you know, you can still be cordial and be respectful to one another. Um, and I, I guess that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty much, that's my spiel. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate it. We went a little over here. We might hear the background or this part might have got cut off, but... Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it so yeah, much. And uh, we'll talk soon. Bye. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining me today. Come back next week and be sure to visit my website at deprimalaw.com to book a call. Or let's connect on Facebook at Law, where you can join my group for more support. Please remember that the information shared is for general and entertainment purposes only. And that by calling in or messaging me, we are not creating an attorney-client relationship. And my advice is not intended to be legal advice. For specific legal advice, please contact a lawyer in your jurisdiction. This show is brought to you by InflowRadio.com, the best curated talk radio network for personal development, wellness, spirituality, and conscious business.